Good evening, everyone. Are you ready for a bedtime story? This one that I want to share with you tonight is taken from Dr. Lillian B. Yeomans. The book is called Healing Treasury for Classic Books on healing complete in one volume. This one is taken from the book Healing from Heaven, Chapter 3, The Source of Sickness. Dr. Yeomans, one fine morning I was called by telegram to a certain rural settlement a beautiful and very rich farming district where I found a terrible state of affairs. A number of people, including some of their very finest young men, were smitten by an awful scourge, a malignant type of typhoid fever. One magnificent specimen of young manhood, a boy of about seventeen, perfectly proportioned, with an intellectual head and a noble face, the oldest son of his father, who was one of the wealthiest men in the vicinity. This young man was in the throes of death, perfectly unconscious when I arrived. Needless to say, I did what I could, ministered to the sick ones according to the best methods then in vogue. But do you think I stopped at that? You know I did not. I should have been guilty of criminal negligence if I had not taken steps to have the source of the infection discovered with the view of shutting it off absolutely, and so stamping out the deadly disease. And the last time I visited then that beautiful place, I found a great change. The farmers had completely altered their manner of life. The water supply was now free from contamination and the most sanitary methods prevailed in their homes, stables, and dairies, so that their connection with the source of the epidemic was shut off, and I never heard of any more typhoid fever in that district. I don't think they ever had any more. Now, do you understand the parable or the parallel? I'm sure you do. We have learned from our study of God's creative work that it is his will that his masterpiece, man, should be as he created, in the image of God, quote, very good and free from all deformity, disability, and disease. This is God's eternal purpose regarding man for whatsoever, quote, God doeth, it shall be forever. End quote. Ecclesiastes 3.14 That being the case, let us ask, what is the source of all the disease that we see about us that is working in some of our homes and even in our bodies? And let us make inquiry with the view of shutting off our connection with the source of the evil, if it be possible, so that we may stand perfect and complete in all the will of God as it is revealed in his word. Our whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless under the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 It was the best thing that ever happened to those farmers when they discovered that the typhoid was due to dead hogs in the water supply, for they could get rid of them 
and keep rid of them for all time to come. If they had gone on drinking dead hog soup, they would have gone on having typhoid. But they didn't have to go on drinking it, for there was plenty of pure, sparkling water, free from all germs, to be had for the taking. And I believe that God will enable me to point out something important from his word to all who will listen. First, the source of sickness, and second, how it may be absolutely shut off, and how we may drink of the water of life freely, instead of the contaminated wells of earth, which, like the water supply in the typhoid-infested district, contain waters of death. Let us go back then to the book of Genesis and we shall find Satan, the source of sin and sickness, making his initial attack on man with the words addressed to Eve, Yea, hath God said, Genesis 3.1. Satan was compelled to attack God's word, to question the authenticity of the divine revelation. For so long, as man rests on the word of God, he is perfectly invincible, impregnable, immovable. Psalm 125 verse 1 says, They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed, but abideth forever. Satan cannot touch them. Rather, they are the most serious menace to all satanic devices, plans, plots, and schemes. For to them has been given power over all the power of the enemy. There is not a reinforcement which the Prince of Darkness can order up from the profoundest depths of his dark domain for which those who believe God's word are not more than a match. Not a poison gas manufactured in hell, which the breath of God will not dissipate. Not a fiery dart, which the shield of faith will not quench. Not a pestilence, which the precious blood, boldly displayed on the lintel and doorposts of our dwellings, will not avert. Isaiah 54, 17, No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. So, whether it be shot, or shell, gas, liquid fire, bombs, tanks, submarines, airplanes, artillery, cavalry, or infantry, pestilence, famine, earthquake, lightning, or malicious tongues, we are perfectly safe so long as we are abiding in the word of God. Satan must dislodge us from our refuge in the secret place of the Most High before he can so much as touch us. Hmm. Hence his introductory remark to our mother Eve, Yea, he always propitiates, conciliates, agrees with us as much as possible, and avoids antagonizing us unnecessarily. <laughs> Yea, hath God said, Genesis 3.1. Oh, hath God said, was hatched in hell. Hear the serpent speak that word. Every soul that ever fell entertained that thought of God. God hath said, yes, God hath said. God hath said, yes, search the word. For what God hath said is all. All you need and more and more. Here is a most abundant store. God hath said. Yes, God hath said. God hath said, lo, 
and it is done. What remains for us but praise? While he conquers in the fight, praise the holiest in the height. God hath said, yes, God hath said. Yes, God who at sundry times and in diverse manners spake in time past unto the fathers by the prophets hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son. Hebrews 1, 1 and 2. God hath said, and here in the Bible is what he said. And if we will but abide in that word and treat any suggestion that would cast even the remotest doubt on the authenticity of this revelation or its living truth and every part of it to us at this moment as from the author of lies, continuous victory is ours. God hath said, and here in the Bible is what he said. And if we will but abide in that word and treat any suggestion that would cast even the remotest doubt on the authenticity of this revelation or its living truth in every part of it to us, at this moment, as from the author of lies, continuous victory is ours. And I'm still not satisfied that I'm reading it right, but the point she's making is, God hath said, and here in the Bible is what he said, and if we will treat any suggestion that casts even the remotest doubt on the authenticity of this revelation that God said, and here in the Bible is what he said, if we will resist that, the remotest doubt immediately, then continuous victory will be ours. Ha <laughs> ha Oh, hallelujah. But alas, Mother Eve did not resist, but allowed Satan to instill doubt, which matured into unbelief and developed into disobedience and sin, sickness, sorrow, and death entered the world. I found the progression here very interesting how she's stating this. Eve allowed Satan to instill doubt. Doubt matured into unbelief, and unbelief developed into disobedience, and disobedience resulted in sin, sickness, sorrow, and death. So this tells us we must resist doubt immediately so that it doesn't mature into unbelief and lead to disobedience. Then God gave them the promise of a Savior and responded to the faith in that promise by bestowing on them redemption in a type. He clothed them with garments not made by themselves, which cost the lives of innocent victims. These were placed on them by God's own hands and enveloped them, spirit, soul, and body. Here we have a beautiful picture of the redemption which is ours in Christ Jesus. Note that it takes in the body. God clothed them and enveloped their physical beings, as well as their souls and spirits in a righteousness provided by the sacrifice. Jesus took the death penalty which we had earned and gave us his life, eternal life, instead. Hence, apprehension of Jesus Christ in all his offices by simple faith brings perfect peace, and thank God, tis everlasting peace, sure as Jehovah's throne. Now we can get rid of sickness and stay rid of it through the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus. And she closes with a little short verse. Banished my sickness, those stripes did heal. 
because the work on Calvary is finished. Now in my body is life, I feel, because the work on Calvary is finished. I saw several things in this little story. I saw two waters, two sources of water, one that poisoned and one that gave life. I saw the two laws again, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus and the law of sin and death. I saw the two of how God created everything and it was good and then how by one man, Adam, and one woman, Eve, Mother Eve, sin came into the world and death by sin. So we see twos here as we go down through this little story that Dr. Yeomans is telling us two. And it's interesting to think also when God killed the animals and clothed Adam and Eve, he didn't leave their bodies out. He covered them, spirit, soul, and body. So in redemption, your body has not been left out. Drink of the waters, the pure, clean waters of life. Freely. Oh, hallelujah. Father, I thank you right now in Jesus' name. Father, the parable, the story that Dr. Yeomans told about the contaminated water and the pure, clean water. Father, help those that hear this little story if they don't remember anything else, any of the other words that were said. Father, about but one thing or two things, Father, about the waters, the clean waters and the dirty waters and the dangers of giving in to doubt at its first suggestion. Oh, Father, equip your saints for wellness. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. I hope you've enjoyed this little bedtime story. I'm looking forward to our next one.